Shabbat Shalom. If I were to ask, then you know what I'm going to. What is, name for me, please, one of the, mo the most miraculous thing that went with the Israelites daily, there's your hint, as they traveled through the desert. Shout, what, shout to me, what? Mana, wow, right off the bat. Nice job, table 12. You guys got it there. Yes, the, <laughs> the mana that God gave to the Israelites in the desert. This was miraculous. What was miraculous about it? It was there. It was food that they could eat no matter where they were. We're told it, you know, tasted delicious. It was all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things. But in the Parsha that we just read, God says that manna was in some sense a hardship and a punishment. How was manna, right? We're told that manna, that God says, I, I gave you the hardships of the manna in order to test you. I subjected you to the hardship of hunger and gave you manna so that you would learn that not by bread alone does a human being exist, but, by every, but one may live by that which God decrees. So the rabbis are hard pressed to figure out what do you mean the mana was a hardship? How does it work? Well, and so they come up with different ideas. Uh, one, one says that it was uh, constantly, you were just a little bit hungry, right? It would feed you sort of enough to get your calorie count for the day, but it wasn't really satisfying. You would still be sort of hungry. And that was kind of the punishment of the mana. Later, Hasidic rabbis reading into this idea of the mana is meant to teach you that it is not by bread alone that a person can live, read it as a spiritual hunger, right? That the point of the mana was to remind us that real sustenance comes from God or a miracle or something out there and not by bread. And there's something wonderful to that idea that in our lives today, the physical world around us, the food that we eat, this is important to be sure. But there's something else that really animates our existence. There's a spirit, there's something beyond the physical world, and we ignore that at our peril. And one of our medieval commentaries, Rabbeinu Bachia, points out that bread, and we're going to take his word for it on this one, that bread is one of the more elaborate creations human beings could come up with in the ancient world. Now, right, when you think about this, the, the rabbis talk about all the different things that it took to make bread. You have to grow the wheat. You have to harvest the wheat. You have to separate the wheat from the chaff, which involves throwing it in the air to, or something. You have to then mill the other stuff. You have to take the flour. You have to bake the bread, which requires some sort of special apparatus in order to bake the bread. Then once you bake the bread, you have to find a way to distribute the bread. Then you can then, only then, can you eat the bread, right? Which is why it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek that the bracha for bread is hamotzi lechem min haaretz, right? I don't know where you just go into the ground and pull out loaves of sourdough, maybe in San Francisco. But for the rest of us, bread doesn't just come out of the ground. It's made. It's a creation. And so for Rabbeinu Bachia and for us, when we think about what does it mean then when God says that it is not by bread alone that human beings live. God is saying it is not just by the work of your hands, by the things that human beings create that people live. And that is a lesson that I think all of us today can and should hear. Because we live in a world full of our creations. Thank God we have the ability to put houses and roofs over our head. We can air condition them or heat them to our desire. We can travel at the speeds previously unknown to anyone, and we do so in comfort, right? If you've, you take an airplane and you think to yourself, I'm sitting in a nice, comfortable chair. I know they're not, but they're comfortable chairs. Hurtling through the sky to get wherever you want, the ability that we have 
to create miracles in our lives is previously unknown for our species. And yet, it's not by bread alone that human beings can live. All of the things that we create are wonderful, but they're not all that we have. And they're not here to save us. One of the people I like to quote all the time, Aldo Leopold, uh, founder of uh, American Conservation, he wrote that one of the greatest spiritual dangers that can befall a person is to believe that heat comes from the furnace and that eggs come from the grocery store. Because if we are too far separated from the natural world around us, from the things that are not human creations, we lose what the Hasidic rabbis are talking about as well, the spiritual connection and the belief that there is something beyond our world. We're too wrapped up in the physical things we create and the comforts that we have. And then we go back to the mana. So what is the mana here to teach us? Well, according to a famous professor on the book of Devarim, uh, Dr. Professor Jeff Tige writes that, if you remember, if not, then uh, you'll, just, you'll just back me up, that mana in the desert is effectively translated as, if I got this right, whatchamacallit. Did I get it? Yeah, okay, good. The point, mana, right, the word mana comes from mean, right? That, that be, the Israelites walked out of their tent, they saw this honeydew-like something substance, and they said, what's that? And that became the word. What's that is the word for mana. So what is the mana then here to teach us? It's not that it was a little bit good or a little bit bad, or that it sort of satisfied our hunger that it didn't. The whole point of mana is that the Israelites looked at the natural world and they said, what is that? What is this thing? And they investigated and they found that it was good and it was great and it was substantive. So for us, bread is important. The things that we can create in our lives are important. We should be a part of that creation. We should rely on them. It's good. And at the same time, we have to question the things in our lives. We have to question the world around us. We cannot lose a desire to feel the elements, to feel what it means to be outside, to feel what our ancestors felt, to inquire about the natural world around us and remember that we are a part of it because while the things that we create are good, we cannot live on that bread alone. So I hope we take some time this summer to get out from our air conditioning just a little bit, to get outside, to find some nature, to find the world around us, to ask and to question about the things in our lives and find that which is behind this, the, the physical world, the spiritual world that we all belong to and which will please God sustain us and keep us going in the year to come. Shabbat Shalom.